Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back. TJ here with Dead History. And welcome back to part two of our look at the 20th President of the United States, James A. Garfield. Uh, Of course, I'm flying solo, as I said, for this week. Henry's not with me, so I'm going to jump right in. Today, in part two, we're going to be taking a look at the presidency of Garfield, uh, which, yes, was very short-lived due to his assassination, but we're going to take a look at that, some of those things leading up to uh, his presidency and his presidency. And then, of course, we're going to take a look at the assassination and, uh, you know, all that stuff, where he died, where he's buried, all that good stuff. So let's jump right in. Um, James Garfield actually never pursued presidential office. Uh, James Garfield thought he was attending the 1880 Republican National Convention to uh, stump for Treasury Secretary John Sherman as the party's presidential candidate. Instead, the convention came to an impasse over Sherman, James Blaine, and Ulysses S. Grant. I had mentioned this briefly in uh, part one, telling you guys about the uh, Republican Convention of 1880. To help unclog the stalemate, Wisconsin's delegation threw Garfield's name into the hat as a compromise candidate. Not only did he win the election, but he became the only sitting House member elected president. The whole process took Garfield by surprise as he once told friends that this honor comes to me unsought. I have never had the presidential fever, not even for a day. So uh, pretty interesting. He never really even wanted to be president, but sure enough... Uh, he was elected president. Uh, as I just said, he in the uh, he was a compromise candidate uh, for president. Garfield was not the Republican Party's first choice as a nominee in the election of 1880. After 36 ballots, Garfield won the nomination as a compromise candidate between conservatives and moderates. Chester Arthur was chosen to run as his vice president. He ran against Democrat Winfield Hancock. The campaign was a true clash of personality over issues. The final popular vote was extremely close. Garfield only receiving 1,898 more votes than his opponent. Garfield, however, received 58%, which was 214 out of 369, of the electoral vote to win the presidency. So, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, In that November election, as I said, the Republican defeated Democrat Winfield Scott Hancock, who was a fellow Union Army general. Uh, Garfield remains the sole incumbent member of the House of Representatives to ever be elected president, Um, which is really, truly remarkable when you think about it. Um, Garfield, this is kind of a fun little fact. He was a Southpaw, and he was actually the very first left-handed president. He was also the first ambidextrous president. It is said you could ask him a question in English and he could simultaneously write the answer in Greek with one hand and in Latin with the other. Yes, you heard me. That is incredible. Like anybody that doesn't think that that is like, wow, that is unreal. Yeah, Garfield was a former Ohio congressman who could literally write Latin with one hand and Greek with the other simultaneously. I will repeat that again, as I just did. Un, that is so super intelligent. Uh, Really, really incredible. So pretty cool stuff there about Garfield. Uh, Kind of a first, James Garfield's mother was a first. President Garfield's mother was actually the very first president's mother to attend her son's inauguration. So yes, Eliza, she uh, attended James's uh, inauguration. She was the very first mother to ever do so. So pretty interesting stuff. Uh, At least I think. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, During his brief presidency, he dealt with what was known as the Star Route Scandal. While in office, the Star Route Scandal occurred. While President Garfield was not implicated, it was found that many members of Congress, including those of his own party, were illegally profiting from private organizations who purchased postal routes out west. Garfield showed himself to be above party politics by ordering a complete investigation. The aftermath of the scandal resulted in many important civil service reforms. Um, So there you go. That just kind of shows you the integrity of James Garfield. 
Um, even though these people were in his own party, he did not care. Uh, he still had an investigation go on about them. Um, as I said, in 1880, I touched on this already. It was another close election. It was split evenly between the North and the South. And then, of course, inevitably, though, gave the keys to the White House to the 49-year-old Republican James Garfield. Um, and the truth is that the 20th president, one of the reasons he's my favorite, no, I shouldn't say favorite, one of my favorite presidents, is he had such great potential. He really did. I mean, he was so intelligent. In my opinion, some people will say maybe Thomas Jefferson. Some people will even say Bill Clinton, who's highly intelligent. Um, in my opinion, though, James Garfield was the most brilliant, most naturally intelligent president we've ever had. Um, he was truly brilliant. Like, he was genius level brilliant. So, you know, and the unfortunate thing is he had great potential, but however, you know, 200 days in, his term came to an abrupt end, as we know. Uh, we're going to get into that here in a few minutes. Another thing that happened during his presidency, he got caught up in an immigration scandal. Uh, just weeks before the general presidential election in November of 1880, Garfield's political opponents tried to deal a fatal blow to his campaign by circulating a letter Garfield had written to an associate named H.L. Morey, addressing the matter of foreign workers. In it, Garfield supported the idea of Chinese laborers, a controversial point of view at the time, at a time the country was nervous about immigration affecting employment. So Democrats handed out hundreds of thousands of copies of the letter in an effort to sour voters on his candidacy. In Denver, the prospect of foreign workers prompted a riot. And at first, Garfield remained silent, but not because he was ashamed of the letter. He simply couldn't recall writing it or signing it. It was dated just after he was elected to the Senate. And he had signed lots of letters that he and his friends wrote in reply to the congratulatory messages he had received. But after consulting with his friends, he issued a denial. And after seeing a reproduction in a newspaper, Garfield announced it was a phony. Furthermore, H.L. Morey didn't seem to even exist. Turns out the letter was planted by the opposition to discredit Garfield's name. Journalist Kenward Philp, who published the letter, was put on trial for libel and forgery, but he was acquitted. Kenward Philp. Uh, Philp. He published the letter. He actually went on trial for libel and forgery, but he got off. He was acquitted. One witness who claimed they met Maury, H.L. Maury, who didn't even exist, one witness claimed they met him, and they were jailed for eight years for perjury. So, yeah, uh, pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> pretty interesting stuff uh, about Garfield there and his presidency and that scandal. That really wasn't a scandal. Uh, James Garfield was a big proponent, and he defended civil rights. Uh, several presidents in or near Garfield's era, Andrew Johnson, Woodrow Wilson, had less than flattering views on Reconstruction and civil rights. But Garfield made his opinion abundantly clear. Speaking during his inauguration, Garfield celebrated the dissolution of slavery and called it the most important political change since the Constitution. Garfield also appointed four black men to his administration, including activist Frederick Douglass as recorder of deeds for the District of Columbia. So yes, Garfield was a very, very good man, and he was very ahead of his time. He truly was. When it came to real, true rights of African Americans and blacks in, in the United States, he totally was all for it and he definitely uh, was not somebody who uh, did not you know did not believe in it or did not agree with it that's for sure Garfield was also one of three presidents in the year of 1881 only two times in American history have there been three presidents in the same year the first time was in 1841 the second time was in 1881 when Rutherford B. Hayes relinquished the office to James Garfield, and then Garfield died later that year, which we're going to get into here, and then Chester Arthur, his vice president, became president. So pretty interesting fact there. 
Um, what else can I tell you here? So, Garfield, he spent uh, a significant amount of time during the first four months of his term filling openings for political appointments, which actually exceeded 80,000. One person who did not receive a post was 39-year-old Charles Gateau, who had delivered several unremarkable speeches on Garfield's behalf during the 1880 campaign. The mentally ill Gateau believed he was responsible for Garfield's election and viewed the Paris consulship as fitting payment. The office seeker turned up at the executive mansion at least 15 times to claim his reward. He also frequented the State Department. When Secretary of State James Blaine informed Gateau that he would not receive the appointment, Charles Gateau was outraged. He came to believe that God wanted him to assassinate James Garfield and that this act would bring him the prestige he deserved. So, yeah, uh, he was crazy, truly mentally ill. Um, you know, just to read you another uh, something here about Garfield. Garfield decided to go off to a college reunion, actually. He got as far as the Washington Railroad Station and there, standing next to Secretary of State James G. Blaine, that's who's here on the screen now, James G. Blaine, the Secretary of State, Garfield was shot twice in the back by an office seeker named Charles Gateau. And right here on your screen now is Charles Gateau. He believed that he had been denied the throne of England by Queen Victoria. He was a serious loon. He truly was. Um... Really crazy. Uh, so, read you a little bit more here about uh, Garfield's assassination. First, what you're taking a look at here on your screen, these are a couple of the signs right near the uh, National Mall there in Washington, D.C. This is the approximate location of where that Washington train station once stood where Garfield was assassinated. It was right here, right in this general location, where you're seeing these pictures on your screen now. So that is where it happened. Uh, that is where he was assassinated. Pretty remarkable stuff. And those signs, just so everybody knows, were just put up within the past few years. There was no sign or nothing indicating the location of President Garfield's assassination site for many, many, many years, forever. So, uh... It's very cool that they put up those signs, of course. So now, Garfield's hospitalization at the time, which lasted about three to four months, it really resulted in little impact on the U.S. government. It gives you a sense as to the role of the presidency and that presidential responsibility had dropped a great deal. Um, and, you know, Garfield truly did. He suffered a long, lingering death. You know, he didn't get particularly uh, great medical care after being shot. Um, you know, he just he just was not he, he just was not good. Uh, he, the president, President Garfield, was quickly tended to by a number of physicians in the hopes he could survive the bullet stuck in his abdomen. But the doctors didn't bother washing their hands before sticking their fingers in his wound. And at that time, the idea of an antiseptic medical environment was being promoted but not widely used. Um, for two weeks, Garfield languished in bed as his caregivers attempted to remove the projectile, but succeeded only in worsening both the incision in his stomach and the accompanying inf infection. Um, so, yeah, he hung around for about almost 80 days. Um Pretty incredible, crazy stuff. And Charles Gateau, he was actually hanged for the crime in 1882. He was arrested uh, and later hanged. Um, just to give you kind of another little synopsis here. Within a day of the attack, a dozen physicians examined the victim's back. Victim being James Garfield. But none were able to determine the location or the trajectory of the ammunition. Dr. D.W. Bliss an acquaintance of the president who had lost his practice, assumed control of the scene and barred other medical professionals from seeing the patient. Bliss was wary of emerging theories about bacteria and probed Garfield's wound without washing his hand and instruments used numerous times over the ensuing weeks. 
Um, and as I said, Gateau was captured immediately after the shooting, after he shot Garfield, and he was ex- executed by hanging. The exact date that Charles Gateau was uh, hung was June 30th of 1882. Uh, now, unfortunately, there's nothing to go see uh, as far as uh, Gouteau's body because it was cremated and most of his body, including his brain, was donated um, to the, I believe it was the, maybe the medical science um, affiliate or the archives or something to that effect. But I know that his brain definitely was donated and I'm pretty sure they still have it. Of course, it's not open to the public. You can't see that. But there is no actual gravesite of Charles Gateau, or else I would have, of course, gone and visited it. Another really cool little fact, real quick, before I read you something uh, truly incredible about the assassination. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell. Yes, the telephone guy. He tried to save Garfield's life. During Garfield's bedridden final days, the public at large tried their best to lend sympathies and possible solutions. One letter writer suggested that doctors simply turn him upside down so the bullet would fall out. A slightly more reasonable but no more effective tactic was offered by Alexander Graham Bell. Inviting a large measure of respect for his invention of the telephone, Graham Bell was allowed to use a makeshift metal detector over Garfield's body to see if the electromagnetic fields would be disrupted by the presence of the bullet, revealing its location in James Garfield's abdomen. Bell was, of course, unsuccessful, though he reportedly did manage to dis- to, to detect the metal in the president's mattress with his, uh, you know, device. So, pretty interesting stuff there. I never knew that. Uh, I found that kind of fascinating, of course, uh, about uh, Alexander Graham Bell. You know, very famous uh, person in history, of course. Uh, but, so now what I'm going to read you guys, of course, uh, I'm going to read you basically... Right from the um, the President is Dead book, uh, I've talked about this book many times. I quote this and I read from it almost during all of my videos. Uh, it is a phenomenal book. It is called The President is Dead. It's by Louis Pacone, is the author. Louis Pacone actually just wrote another book called Grant's Tomb about Ulysses S. Grant's tomb. So if you love this, like, you know, presidential grave site and that sort of stories behind the presidential deaths and that sort of thing and the burials really do yourself a favor and go by the president is dead uh it's phenomenal so i want to give all the credit to lewis pacone you know most of these words that i'm reading off of uh when i read these things i'm reading word for word right from the book uh these are not my own words uh these are lewis's words but they're phenomenal and they're just poignant and that's why I read them because they're they're great. So I'm going to read you uh, about James Garfield and the assassination right now. Just give me one second here now. Okay, here we go. On July 2nd of 1881, President James Garfield entered the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station in Washington, D.C. Garfield was in good spirits, looking forward to visiting his alma mater, Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, for his 26th reunion. He had no uh, security as he walked to his train with his good friend, Secretary of State James Blaine, and his children, Jim and Harry. Suddenly, Charles J. Gateau, who had snuck up behind Garfield, pulled out a 44 caliber British Bulldog pistol and fired twice. The first bullet grazed the president's arm and bore clear through a toolbox carried by a stunned worker. The second bullet ripped Garfield's chest, broke a rib, and pierced his first lumbar vertebrae, but missed his spinal column and all major organs. A shocked Garfield cried out, My God! My God! What is this? Blaine shouted at the assailant, In God's name, man! What did you shoot the president for? Gateau, a frustrated, delusional lawyer who believed that Garfield owed him a patronage job as ambassador to Spain, coolly replied, I am a stalwart and want Arthur for president. As a crowd rushed toward the fallen president, his son Harry tried to keep them away 
and give his father some air. Garfield weakly asked the ladies' room attendant for water, but after taking a drink, he began to vomit. Five minutes after the shooting, Dr. Smith Townsend, health officer from the D District of Columbia, arrived. He checked Garfield's pulse, and finding it had dropped to 53 beats per minute, he administered brandy and ar aromic spirit of ammonia. Aromatic. See? Aromatic spirits of ammonia. To prevent Garfield from fainting, that's why he gave him the ammonia. The doctor poked his finger directly into the wound in Garfield's back to find the bullet. This was done on the filthy train station floor, and Townsend hadn't even washed his hands. It was in this moment that Garfield's slow death began. More doctors streamed toward the president until there were ten hovering over him, poking and probing his body in a similar unsanitary fashion. Townsend wanted to move Garfield away from the crowd to a private area where he could be better examined. The president was placed on a horsehair and hay mattress and carried upstairs to an empty room. 39-year-old African-American Charles Purvis, surgeon-in-chief at Freedman's Hospital, arrived and recommended that Garfield be kept warm with hot water bottles and blankets. In this brief examination, Purvis made history as the first African-American doctor to ever treat a president. Garfield lay on the mattress in a dire state, vomiting and drifting in and out of consciousness. His cabinet members arrived, including Secretary of War Robert Todd Lincoln, who sent for Dr. Will Willard Bliss. His name was actually Dr. Doctor. Interesting. His name was actually Doctor. So it was actually Dr. Dr. Willard Bliss. Very interesting. He had helped treat his father, Abraham Lincoln, on the night he was shot. So Garfield had first met Bliss in Ohio almost four decades earlier, and Secretary Lincoln believed Garfield would be comfortable under his care. As soon as Bliss arrived, he took control and inserted an unsterilized probe into Garfield's body to find the bullet, poking and prodding in flesh that had already become a well-traveled channel. Garfield... The battle-hardened Civil War veteran withstood the immense pain without the benefit of anesthesia. Bliss then tried using his finger, sticking it inside Garfield's body, far enough to feel bone. Unable to find the bullet, Bliss abandoned the search for the time being. Eventually, James Garfield could not tolerate it any longer and asked to be taken to the White House. A half hour after he'd been shot, the president was carried down the steps and placed in an ambulance. False reports made their way to the public that he was already dead. To counter such rumors, Bliss released an extraordinarily optimistic official bulletin from the White House at 11.30 a.m. The president has returned to his normal condition, will make another examination soon. His pulse is now 63. An hour later came another update. The reaction from the shot injury has been very gradual. He is suffering some pain, but is thought best not to disturb him by making an exploration for the ball until after the consultation at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The president's condition, if it ever was as rosy as Bliss reported, began to deteriorate almost immediately after the 12.35 p.m. bulletin. By 1.20 p.m., the report was grim. His pulse was 112. Some nausea and vomiting have occurred. Considerable hemorrhage has taken place from the wound. At 2.30 p.m., the president's symptoms continued to grow more unfavorable. Finally, at 2.40 p.m., President Garfield has but few chances of recovery, and he may not live 12 hours. Those who saw the president confirmed the prognosis for the countless reporters who had gathered at the White House. <clears throat> Judge Samuel Shellebarger lamented there seems to be absolutely no hope of his rallying. 
His symptoms are growing more alarming, and his death is thought to be very near. By 7 p.m., Garfield's pulse was at a feverish pace of 140. He was administered morphine to ease the pain, but few expected he would survive the first night. He asked about his chances, prompting a brutally honest physician to bluntly answer, One chance in a hundred. He replied, Then we will take that chance. Throughout the night, Garfield's sleep was interrupted almost every half hour by regurgitation of the stomach. Despite the long odds, Garfield survived the night, and by the morning, his prognosis had improved. The day after the shooting, Dr. Bliss summoned two surgeons to the White House. Dr. Davis Hayes Agnew, Chief of Surgery from the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Frank Hamilton from Bellevue Medical College in New York, while while Garfield's wife, Lucretia, called upon the services of two more, Garfield's cousin, Dr. Silas Boynton, and Dr. Susan Ann Edson, one of the first female doctors in America and Lucretia's personal physician. Garfield rested in an upstairs White House bedroom Cordoned off by screens rendering him virtually invisible to most staff. Bliss strictly limited visitors' access and few were permitted to see the president. Bliss continually administered what now seems more like a recipe for a wild frat party, rum, wine, and morphine. But Garfield still experienced excruciating pain in his lower extremities, which he described as like being lacerated by tiger's claws. By all accounts, he faced the situation with courage, grace, gratitude, and a sense of humor. Bliss Bliss prescribed a rich diet of heavy meats and potatoes, washed down with a dose of brandy, which Garfield could not always keep down. His digestive system was further strained by daily doses of quinine to ward off malaria. Quinine or Quinine? Quinine? In Washington's summer swelter, the heat and humidity were oppressive. To comfort the patient, Navy engineers designated a complex system to pipe air into Garfield's room, cooled by three tons of ice each day at a cost of $5 per ton. This revolutionary appliance, the country's first air conditioner, was first tried on July 11th and the air was found to be cool, dry, and ample in supply. Bliss began to feel optimistic after Garfield survived the first precarious days and told a New York Times reporter, it was a happy wound after all. I think it's almost certain that we should pull him through. On July 21st, Lucretia told a friend that the president was out of danger. But the next morning, his health began to reverse course when the wound expelled a large amount of pus, cloth, and bone. On July 23rd, his temperature spiked to a dangerous 104 degrees, and he vomited bile three times. Bliss again sent for Hamilton and Agnew. Without anesthesia, they opened up his back to drain additional pus. Two days later, they operated to remove bone fragments, muscle, and tissue. While they did not find the bullet, they undoubtedly introduced copious amounts of germs into the wound. The doctor still had not given up, the doctors, I should say, still had not given up their quest for the elusive bullet. To aid in the search, Alexander Graham Bell offered his latest invention, a primitive metal detector. It was tried in secrecy for the first time in late July, with Bell making last-minute alterations to the machine up until he arrived at the White House. He was greeted by the president, who asked the young inventor to explain how the contraption worked. Bell found the president's appearance startling, having an ashen gray color, which makes one feel for a moment that you are not looking upon a living man. Bell was unable to locate the slug. 
<clears throat> and when Garfield tried, he called it. When Garfield tired, he called it off. His experiment was a failure. Bell returned home to discover that the problem was a hasty last-minute adjustment he had made incorrectly. On August 1st, at Dr. Bliss's request, Bell made another attempt. Bliss was convinced the bullet was near Garfield's liver on his right side and had the experiment focus on that area. The detector did signal uh, it had located metal, and Bliss declared success, while Bell remained hesitant. It is now widely believed that the false positive was caused by metal coils beneath the horsehair mattress. On August 8th, an operation was performed to drain more pus, which the stoic Garfield again endured without anesthesia. But it was futile. Large pockets of toxic pus and bile had already ravaged his insides. One abscess in his sal salivary, gl gland, salivary gland had become so enlarged that it had burst, draining into his ear canal and mouth and nearly drowning him. An oblivious Dr. Bliss still felt that the wound was not life-threatening, telling a reporter that the wound is in a state that causes up us no apprehension whatsoever. Even Dr. Bliss acknowledged concern over the president's shocking weight loss. When he was shot, James Garfield weighed a robust 230 pounds. But now, he regurgitated almost anything he tried to swallow. <clears throat> The only nourishment he could keep down was kumis, fermented horse milk, which was not sufficient to prevent drastic weight loss. By the end of August, James Garfield had dropped 80 pounds. Dr. Bliss resorted to rectally feeding him a meal called enamata, a nutrition-rich cocktail consisting of beef boiling, egg yolks, milk, and opium. As he monitored its effectiveness, he adjusted the formula, sometimes adding whiskey and replacing milk with charcoal. By this humiliating method, the President of the United States was fed every four hours for eight consecutive days. In addition to speeding up his weight loss, it also caused severe dehydration. The wounded Garfield wanted to leave Washington for more comfortable surroundings. His first inclination was to return to his home in Mentor, Ohio. But hoping the sea air would prove therapeutic, he opted for the ocean. Lucretia was against the idea, fearing the trip would be too arduous, and wanted to have him move to the soldier's home in Washington, D.C. Despite his weakened condition, Garfield overruled his wife. New, Year, New York financier and railroad magnate Charles G. Franklin offered the use of his 20-room cottage on the seashore in Elberon, New Jersey, a part of Long Branch frequented by the rich and famous of the era and accustomed to hosting presidents such as Grant and Hayes. Later presidents to stay in the seaside town included Arthur, Benjamin Harrison, McKinley, and Wilson. On the morning of September 6th, James Garfield was carried from the White House in a stretcher and placed in a carriage. And at 6.10 a.m., the carriage was greeted at the station by a small, curious crowd that had gathered to see him off. A sheet covered his frail body to his neck, and his head was wrapped in bandages in an almost cartoonish fashion. What could be seen of the president horrified those in the crowd. The skin was of a livid color, the cheeks were hollow, and the nose was pinched. An exhausted Garfield could muster none of his good humor to provide a reassuring acknowledgement to the onlookers. He was placed in car number 33, and every effort was made to render the journey comfortable and safe. To reduce smoke and soot, heavy drapes were hung and clean burning anthracite coal was used. Private residences along the route were secured as a precaution. And at 6.20 a.m., General Trainmaster Charles Watts slowly pulled out of the station, but almost immediately had to stop for another train's passage. Silent crowds gathered along the tracks, and men removed their hats in respect. Newspapers followed the president's journey meticulously, 
In addition to station and time, the reports frequently included his pulse. The pa train passed through Baltimore at 8.04 a.m. and Harvard de Grace, Maryland at 9.10 a.m., where it was reported that Garfield appeared to be really enjoying the trip. In Delaware, the train stopped at a coaling station, and Bliss used the opportunity to give the president a sponge bath. Garfield was eager to arrive in Elberon. When asked if he would like to stop again, he replied, Let us reach the end of our journey first. That is most important. Garfield asked to have the engineer increase the speed. Hundreds of workers at the train yards in Philadelphia were instructed to lay down their tools so as not to disturb the president as he went by at 11 a.m. Shortly before noon, the train crossed into New Jersey, rolling by silent crowds on the bridge and in the Trenton Depot. It rode through Princeton a minute before noon and Monmouth Junction at 12.07 p.m. Seven minutes later, the train switched onto the Freehold and Jamesburg Agricultural Line for the final leg of its journey. It arrived in Elberon at 1.35 p.m. as Garfield's pulse hit 110. The Omaha Daily Bee made the obvious comparison describing the spectacle as a weird, funeral-like trip. The night before Garfield's arrival, 2,000 workers had laid new track right up to the cottage. But now, with the home in sight, the train stalled at the bottom of a hill. In an inspiring scene, 200 men approached the train and pushed it the remaining distance so Garfield could be transferred directly into the home. Approximately 15,000 people had gathered in the small town to greet the president, but upon laying eyes <clears throat> on his deathly appearance, many broke down in tears. After Garfield had settled into Franklin Cottage, it seemed at first that the sea air was indeed therapeutic, and he appeared to be recuperating. Dr. Bliss, so often oblivious to the reality of the situation, declared, The trouble has now passed its crisis, and it's going away. Unfortunately, the crisis had not passed, and Garfield was in his final days on Earth. <clears throat> on September 15th, his pulse and temperature rose, and from then on, his health began to plummet. On September 19th, Dr. Bliss was hopeful, and a 5.30 p.m. bulletin noted that Garfield's pulse ranged between 102 and 106 beats per minute. That night, Dr. Bliss asked Garfield if he was uncomfortable, and Garfield replied, not at all. Given Dr. Boynton's view that death was possible but not probable, the reporters departed to file their stories. At approximately 10 p.m., Garfield's friend, David Gaskill Swaim, sat alone with him as he slept. Suddenly, Garfield gasped. Swaim rushed to his bedside and the two locked eyes. Well, Swaim, the president said before grasping his heart and crying out his last words, Oh my, Swaim, what a pain I have right here. As word got out, the end was imminent, imminent People hurried to Garfield's room. Lucretia, his daughter Molly, Garfield's secretary, Joseph Stanley Brown, Colonel A.F. Rockwell, and his wife, Dr. Bliss, Dr. Agnew, Dr. Boynton, his brother-in-law, Camden A. Rockwell, and his African-American servant, Daniel Spriggs. They watched in silence as Dr. Bliss tried in vain to prevent the unpreventable. Finally, at 10.35 p.m. on September 19th of 1881, President James A. Garfield succumbed to his wounds in subsequent medical treatment and died. At just 49 years old, James Garfield supplanted James K. Polk as the youngest president to die. Slowly, the crowd left the room and Lucretia sat with the president for over an hour in solitude. And that was it. James Garfield was dead. I am going to read you here now uh, just a bit as you're looking at pictures of my visit to the location of where the cottage was in Elberon, New Jersey. 
The location of death, the home where Garfield died, was constructed in 1876 as part of the Elberon Hotel and designed by Charles F. McKim for the original owner, Connor T. Jones. The oceanfront 20-room cottage was later owned by New York financier, New York financier Charles G. Franklin. The Franklin Cottage became one of the most popular vacation rentals in the era when Long Branch was a playground for the rich and powerful. After Garfield's death, the home became better known as the Garfield Cottage or the Garfield Cabin. On May 13th of 1889, the home was purchased by lawyer W.D. Guthrie on behalf of Franklin's cousin, Mary McEvers Goslin of England, who paid $50,000 for the cottage and $25,000 more for the furnishings. Guthrie used the home as a rental and two years later put it on the auction block but had no buyers. While many cottages raised their prices over the years, the Garfield Cottage resisted the trend. The price charged the year after Garfield died remained the same through 1900. By 1920, the heyday of Long Branch was coming to an end, and the home had come into the possession of the Fidelity Trust Company of Newark, New Jersey. And on June 15th of 1920, while the home was being painted, a fire broke out, and by the time it was extinguished, much of the roof and the interior were destroyed. What was left of the structure was raised shortly afterward, leaving nothing to let visitors know of the historic events that occurred at this location. Sporadic efforts to mark the site had begun at the turn of the century, and in 1901, the cottage residents proposed to mark the site for the 20th anniversary of Garfield's death. Two residents each committed to a $1,000 donation for the project, but the idea fizzled. Long story short, they finally did put a placard, a roadside marker there, um, and it was it was dedicated uh, in 1957. Bruce Franklin, the son of an Asbury Park insurance broker, learned of Garfield's death so near his house while he was homesick watching television, um, and eventually this marker was made on September 19th of 1961. 80 years after Garfield's death, the ceremony was held, and Bruce, that man who learned of his death, uh, unveiled the 36-square-inch permanent marker. And it reads, Today it still stands at 12 Garfield Terrace off of Ocean Avenue, and it reads, James A. Garfield, 20th President of the United States, born November 19, 1831 at Orange, Ohio, died on this site September 19th of 1881. The seaside location is still home to many well-to-do, although not quite, of the caliber that resided there at the end of the 19th century. Only a few hundred feet away is the Church of the Presidents, where Harrison, Hayes, McKinley, Garfield, Wilson, Grant, and Arthur worshipped. And located on the grounds is the Garfield Tea House, a structure built from the temporary train tracks that were laid during the President's convalescence and disassembled after his death. It was actually built by an actor named Oliver Byron and relocated several times before it was acquired by the Long Branch Historical Museum Association and moved to the church grounds. So, now what you're seeing is that tea house. The Garfield Tea House is the only remaining structure directly related to President Garfield's final trip to New Jersey. The Garfield Tea House was built from the railroad tides used to lay the emergency track that transported the dying president. So it's pretty cool. Uh, it sits there. It's this little red, you know, tea house shack. Um, I went inside of it. That's the pictures you're seeing here. And this is right on the grounds of the Church of the President uh, there in uh, Long Branch, New Jersey. So pretty cool stuff uh, as far as, um, you know, Garfield's little... Long Branch history. Now, finally, the last thing, last but of course, certainly not least, is the James Garfield Memorial, uh, the tomb there uh, in Lakeview Cemetery. Uh, Lakeview Cemetery is in Cleveland, Ohio. I visited here last year. Um, unfortunately, when I visited, the tomb was closed, not only for COVID, but also due to uh, renovations that were being done to the inside of the tomb. So I wasn't able to go inside. I know, and you're going to see some pictures of the inside. 
I know that it's one of the most incredible presidential grave sites and tombs that there is. Uh, it is actually the only presidential tomb where the president's casket is on display. Inside of this tomb is the actual, you'll see on your screen, pictures uh, of a casket with an American flag draped over it. That is the actual casket of President James A. Garfield, the 20th president of the United States. The tomb is beautiful. I mean, obviously, I was only on the outside. Um, Lakeview Cemetery there, where it is, is a beautiful cemetery. And this tomb, this memorial, it sits up on like a hilltop. It's just gorgeous. I mean, you can see from the few pictures I took of just the outside how beautiful it is. Um, and supposedly, it's even more beautiful inside. There's a statue of Garfield inside. Uh, I believe there's even a chandelier um, it's just gorgeous. So these are all the pictures you're seeing. The pictures I took outside and the pictures inside are pictures I did not take, uh, but that you could obviously see, um, you know, from I, I just found them online and that sort of thing. So that is where the 20th president of the United States, James A. Garfield, is laid to rest. Of course, there was a long procession, a uh, long funeral, a uh, long trip, of course, out to Ohio. Um, there was an autopsy done, as a matter of fact, of Garfield. Uh, inevitably, it really was gangrene uh, and his heart and everything. Uh, he had a heart attack. Uh, gangrene. He definitely had gangrene uh, infection due to the uh, non-sterilization of the doctor's hands and instruments. So, pretty incredible stuff. Uh, but yes, James Garfield assassinated. Only the second president ever in our history to be assassinated by Charles Gateau in Washington, D.C. at the railroad station. Eventually was moved down to Elberon, New Jersey, where he actually died right in Elberon, New Jersey. My backyard, so to speak. Uh, and yeah, and then he was uh, obviously uh, taken out to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, to the Lakeview Cemetery. Uh, and that is where he's laid to rest in this beautiful memorial. So... There you go, the life, legacy, assassination, and death of the 20th president of the United States, James A. Garfield. Hope you enjoyed this look into things. I know it was a little uh, long-winded, me reading all the details of his uh, assassination and death, but I thought it was really cool to include, so hope you enjoyed it. Uh, one of my favorite presidents of all time. Truly a shame that he was assassinated, not only for the obvious reasons, but also because he had so much potential and I wish we could have seen what he would have done as president because uh, he definitely was ahead of his time. So there you go. Thanks for joining, guys. Thanks for the subscribes, the likes, the comments, the questions, all of it. Leave them below. Please leave those comments and questions. I'd love to hear from you guys. Maybe you guys have some little facts that I didn't touch on about Garfield or his death or his uh, burial site or whatever it may be. So leave that stuff below. I really appreciate it always. Always welcome to comments, uh, compliments, criticism, anything. I, I'm welcome to it all. So I appreciate it very much. We will see you next week when we're going to take a look at the 21st president of the United States, James Garfield's vice president who took over office, Chester Arthur. Stay tuned for that. Thanks again, guys. Bye-bye now.